just to say it is lovely to be back in person and I find it wonderful that Ukraine may be going up in flames, women's rights in the US are in desperate peril, uh, trans rights are across the world seem to be in desperate peril again still. Um, but at least we've solved diversity in tech. I'm no longer presenting to a room of 90% white men. Oh, wait. Um, yeah, it's my perennial whinge. Um, we still need to do better. Uh, take this as a reminder that we still need to do better. Um, and this is my other perennial reminder. I started doing slides like this at the start and end of DEX uh, back in uh, Caribbean DevCon, uh, which was obviously in the Caribbean and lovely. I was giving a talk on, uh, it wasn't on kindness, um, but it was related to kindness. And the organizer said, oh, uh, have you got slides? And I said, no, I haven't. That's OK, we'll, we'll put up a giant picture of you behind. And it's like, no, that would be a terrible, terrible thing. Just put something up that says, be kind. Um, and I've thought since then, if I can encourage people to show a tiny bit more kindness and move the needle very slightly there, I would rather do that than teach you about versioning and dates and times and stuff. And I'm sure you're all very kind people anyway, but I tend to think that if I nudge a little bit, then aside from anything else, I've reminded myself that I need to be kind. So if the person on the tube just you know, um, barges me out the way, just take a, take a moment to be kind. So today, um, this is extremely uh, self, not self-deprecating, there's a word, self-indulgent, that's it. Um, because I'm basically talking about what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, and it's been a lot of fun doing the coding. And I've given this talk a few times. Uh, it has evolved as the code has been evolving. Um, but where, out of interest, how many of you are in Dan North's talk in this room in the last hour? OK, good, because we're going to evaluate some of this against Dan's Cupid. Is it a, does it count as a framework, Dan? I don't know. Against the Cupid properties. Um, but where Dan's talk was very much sort of uh, thought provoking and encouraging you to think deeply, I'm encouraging you to feel passionately. Uh, so you don't really need to care about anything that I've done. What I want you to get is the sense of how much I care about it and how that has hopefully manifested in the software and then in real world usage. And then you can think, oh, what could I do that would be equally fun and meaningful? So this last encourage you to go build stuff is the real thing. There are some interesting tech bits as well. But basically, if right now you have thought, oh, I know exactly what I will go out from John's talk and build, then go and start building it now with a coffee. That's fine. You've, you've taken all the main messages of the talk. So uh, one of the nice things about giving this talk is I get to say I am a committed Christian um, and I'm a Methodist local preacher and I worship at Tilehurst Methodist Church. Uh, Tilehurst, small townish, just to the west of Reading. Um, and I've been involved in the AV, the audiovisual side of things for Tilehurst Methodist Church for almost as long as I've been there because, as Dan said, it's, it's the kind of thing you get uh, roped into. Before the pandemic hit, we had a computer, a projector, and a mixing desk. This was the mixing desk. Perfectly good mixing desk. So it's a Mackie CFX12. It has sort of 12 input channels or 10, depending on how you count a couple that are stereo. Um, and down here, these are called faders, I now know. Wouldn't have been able to tell you that two, two years ago. Uh, these are the important bits that control the volumes. And these are the other important bits that are mute buttons. Nothing else was, oh, this is the master, the main volume controller. That's important. Nothing else is important unless it's wrong. Um, all of these knobs and buttons are at very specific places, and if anyone moved them, it would be wrong and we wouldn't know where. This was a, a source of considerable scariness for me and other people in the tech team, and in particular, the stewards within the church who are sort of responsible for making sure that worship happens on a Sunday morning. 
also for a long time were responsible for doing the AV. So you would welcome the, the preacher or minister, um, give the notices, then come and sit down at the AV desk and be projecting hymn words and muting and unmuting microphones. And a lot of people wanted to be stewards. They really, really didn't want to touch this. So that was the before times. Next is church in lockdown, because I'm going to talk about two apps that I built. Um, and while Dan mentioned that, that naming should be you know, meaningful, I have meaningful but still whimsical names. Um, I had Zoom and Enhance. We did, if you've seen all the uh, NSI or whatever it's called, NCI um, things where they say, OK, well, the reflection in that person's sunglasses on the CCTV camera uh, clearly shows that the person was wearing a Rolex watch, because uh, we'll zoom and enhance and, and see everything. Um, the background is, for a few weeks at the start of the pandemic, TMC, Tarhus Methodist Church, um, did nothing. In fact, a lot of stuff was happening in the background, a lot of pastoral work, checking that people were OK, were able to get shopping, etc. Then on Easter Day 2020, we had our, our first Zoom service. And our minister at the time, Andy, did everything. He was very, very hands-on. So he would um, read a prayer, or you know, pray extempore probably, um, and then start a screen share, click to play a video, etc. We would all watch the video. Then he would come back, and someone else might be doing a reading. So he would stop the screen share, um, make sure everyone was muted, spotlight the person doing the reading, unmute them. Lots and lots of clicks. And at the same time, he's meant to be leading worship, which you know, I know from experience is an energy consuming and exhausting thing to do and wonderful as well. It's all difficult. So he was doing two difficult jobs at the same time. And the next week, I said, why don't you focus on the leading worship? Bit? I will take the Zoom bit. You know, tell me what videos you want to show, uh, what bits of text or whatever, and who we want to spotlight to doing readings and I will, do, I will do all the frantic clicking. So I did. And it worked better. And I thought, there's a lot of clicking. Um, I'd used Zoom a little bit before the pandemic. A lot of people had never heard of it before. Um, but when you do screen sharing, you do start screen share, then decide which screen you want to share. Then if you've got a video or whatever, you then start the video and sort of reverse it all for spotlighting and things. And it seemed a lot of work. But fortunately, I found that Zoom had a C Sharp SDK. And I thought, I wonder if I can automate this. And somehow, at the start of the pandemic, I had a bunch of free time. All the meetings that I would normally have been at were cancelled. They hadn't moved online yet. They were just cancelled. So I was able to whip up a very early prototype version and thought, well, I couldn't possibly use this yet. I thought, do you know what? It's worked in local testing. What's the worst that can go wrong, really? You know, we might have to apologize and say, OK, we'll, we'll go back to doing it manually. Let's just give it a go. So I think that it was only the third service was the first time that Zoom and Enhance was used in anger, in production. Um, and the, the point of Zoom and Enhance is very much on the Zoom side of things. This is deliberately for entirely Zoom-based worship. Um, this was a later version of the UI than, than we started with. And you'll be able to tell throughout this talk that I am not a UI designer. Um, so we have various tabs. You know, it is quite usable. If you know what you're doing, it's very usable. Um, different tabs for things. And the director side was most of what I spent during the service. And that showed uh, you know, all the different scenes you had, uh, different videos to show, and the people that you wanted to spotlight. But it was just for this purpose. And initially, the only user was me. I got a couple of other people within our church to use it. Then there were various uh, sort of training calls where different churches would get together and say, oh, well, we're doing things like this. We're streaming to YouTube. We're streaming to Facebook. We're streaming to, to Zoom, whatever, um, and different concerns. So within TMC, we have always had a Zoom service that is the link to it is not shared outside the church family because then we don't need to worry about Zoom bombing, um, GDPR and copyright things get simpler. Uh, we don't stream it publicly. Um, we now, 
I'll, I'll talk, talk about now, later on. Um, but other churches have gone live on Facebook, all kinds of different things. So people got together and I mentioned Zoom and Enhance and they said, oh, that sounds really useful. So I now have about a dozen users. It's a small but non-single uh, non digit number of users. And everything is around Zoom. Okay, um, that was almost a distraction and that was developed. Um, I pretty much stopped developing it the, by the end of 2020, it was all done. And eventually, we are able to move to more of a hybrid church model. TMC has been relatively conservative in terms of pandemic things, um, but that meant that where some churches opened up in person back in September 2020, we were still all the way through uh, all of 2020 and into 2021, we were working at uh, doing everything over Zoom. But we could see, I knew that eventually we would want to go hybrid. And by hybrid, I mean some people in the church building and some people at home. And my use of words there is very deliberate. And I, I worked out a few things early in the pandemic. Um, one was, hey, with Zoom services, we are able to provide a worship experience for people who are housebound, who might not have been able to come to TMC, the building, um, in the before times. When we can all get back in the building, most of us, we should not let that group of people down. We must be providing Zoom services as long as we have the resources to do so, and I will make desperately, I will try desperately hard to make sure we continue to provide, to have those resources. That was one. The other is the church is not the building. Lots of people said, oh, well, when we get back to church, no, we're in church already. Um, we can be worshipping, I, I was uh, on holiday in Wales and still dialed into the Zoom service. I was in church as far as I was concerned. So I always, and I, I correct myself when I get it wrong, I refer to the church building when I mean the building. Um, because again, getting back to code, because you're here for Cody stuff, names matter. So if you mean the church building, say the church building. So hybrid church was always going to be some people in the church building, some people at home. It's happened slightly slower than I'd expected, but I, I kind of was modeling three situations. One is 10% of people in the church building, 90% at home, and that was the middle of 2021. There was a 50-50 split, which I thought would be quite short, um, where half of the worshippers for any given service would be in the church building and half at home. And then the 90-10, where most people are in the church building, but we still have some people at home on Zoom, and we want to make them feel that they are completely part of the service, which means deliberately making sure that sometimes we have people doing a reading or doing a prayer on Zoom, even if we've got people who could do it in the church building, but you don't want that second class feeling. So that this was what I was planning while we were still on Zoom. And so I started coming up with some requirements for at your service. So at your service is the name of the, the second app, um, named because it's the thing that helps you deliver your service and it is meant to serve you. Um, so hence that. If I refer to AYS, that's the um, obvious acronym for it. But whereas Zoom and Enhance was just me using it and a few other very technical people from other churches, I wanted at your service to be something that would be as easy to use at least as the previous system. Remember the, the scary mixer? Previously, people only had to worry about projecting words onto a screen and turning microphones on and off. We were going to be introducing more stuff in there, and occasionally people would bring PowerPoints, and it's like, oh, well, if you've got a PowerPoint, we'll put John or someone else from the AV team who's comfortable with, with tech stuff. Like, it should be easier than that. So I wanted to make it more powerful than the previous system, but at least as simple, ideally simpler. We, know, we knew that we needed to have cameras, and I'd already been specking out um, a camera, a pan tilt zoom camera, PTZ, um, that we would mount at the back of the church uh, that could then um, you know, 
zoom, uh, pan over and zoom in to show the pulpit or the lectern or whatever. And this part about sound integration was the realization that if you ask people to use two different systems, the computer system and the mixer, where the mixer was terribly scary, but you only needed bits of, bits of it, that would not be great. On the other hand, there's something physically compelling about pressing a button um, that, that makes, that's really intuitive in terms of UI for the muting and unmuting. I'll come back to that. But we've also got, well, you've got to be able to join a Zoom meeting and spotlight Zoom. Can you imagine if I'd said, OK, well, I won't integrate anything. And this is where um, Dan's point about the Unix philosophy. My AYS is the opposite of the Unix philosophy in some ways. It's one tool that does everything for you because I don't want people to have to learn several tools. So if they'd had to say, OK, well, if I'm going to do Zoom spotlighting, I will open up the Zoom app and manually find the right person and spotlight them. Uh, to, to change the sound, I will go into the mixer and unmute that bit. If I want PowerPoint, I will launch PowerPoint, etc. No, people want to do, want an integrated system, I believed. Uh, I wanted to be able to record things, really useful for weddings and baptisms, just as a value add for the church. You know, people, obviously people from the church get married and have babies, uh, but also people get married who we've never seen before or who have some um, relative connection. And it's always nice to be able to say, and we can give you a nice video of your big day. Um, and there's some video playback as well. OK. The things that I have found, oh, about audio mixing. Uh, I was looking earlier on. I'm in no way saying that Dan was boring to watch. No way at all. But I was uh, looking at this now I know new trick speaker connection and seeing between the, the, the lights here, uh, these XLR plugs that I'm pretty sure are taking DMX connections. I wouldn't have known anything of this before. You learn so much, um, mostly useless information as soon as you get into the AV world. It's a really interesting domain. But in terms of audio mixing, we have quite a few microphones. Um, we now, because I am an incorrigible eBay microphone purchaser now, uh, the church has several microphones that it now owns. And my shed, which is my garden office where I keep all my tech stuff and work, um, now has more microphones than really any shed needs. Um, and more than I can actually physically get into my mixer, which is a bit embarrassing. So we have quite a few microphones, but at any time we only need two or three on, and we don't need to do very much with them. So mixers are incredibly versatile bits of, uh, bits of kit these days, but really the day-to-day, -day, once we've set it up, the day-to-day -day is mute and unmute the preacher or the, you know, the, the singing group or the band or whatever, and change some levels. The complicated bit is you sometimes need to change the level in the church building separately from the level in the, that's going out to Zoom. Um, so for example, you don't necessarily want to, order, uh, want to amplify the band. They're already be, uh, where our band is flutes and baritones and things and um, a drum kit. They're already loud enough in the building, but you do want to obviously pick them up and amplify to, to Zoom. So let me show you the, the evolution. We started with a full-blown analog mixer. And I didn't like that idea. Can't control this at all from software. So this is the actual mixer that we've got. This is the one of mine in, in my shed. Um, and this is a Behringer XR18. Um, I would normally have brought along for demo purposes, a spare XR16 um, that is the same apart from not being an audio interface. I, there's no USB port, um, but my rucksack was already quite heavy with other things, and I've also not brought as many cameras as I normally would. However, compare, you know, this is still horrible looking. I don't want anyone dealing with the AV to have to look at that or deal with it, but that's okay because there are almost no knobs and buttons on this, there's a power switch on the side that we don't use because we just turn it on um, 
with the rest of the power. There's a headphone volume knob up there that we don't touch at all. Everything else, it's just connections. It's a bunch of XLR cables, um, two rows of inputs, one row of outputs, um, and a network port. In fact, there are two network ports. The, the one that's empty there is for ultranet monitoring cunning stuff. The one that's sort of mostly hidden in the top left is the control part, and that's what's interesting, because give me a network connection and a documented protocol, and I can control things. So that's all very well, uh, but the only way of muting things if you don't have something to control it um, is by pulling out the leads, and I don't want to be doing that. So let's see what software the XR18 comes with. Well, this is one page of it. This is the, the mixer page. Oh, so uh, yeah. Um, so you have all the channels down at the bottom, and then up at the top, you have either channel, input, gate, equalizer, um, compressor, the various ways. It's really, really complicated. I don't know my way around this um, because it can do so many things. It's got various special effects things that you can have either inline or uh, I can't even remember what the name for having it adjacent is. It's all really complicated. I use one effect on our church one, which is I change a stereo, <coughs> stereo input into a mono, basically. Just combine them in the simplest possible way. So again, this is something I did not want to give to users at all, because it's got nearly as many knobs and buttons as the horrible hardware mixer, just kind of disguised. This is my software uh, using WPF. <clears throat> um, and bits of this are open source and bits aren't. Uh, the, the underlying library that allows you to do this is open source. I can't remember whether any of the GUI isn't. There are complicated reasons why it's not all open source. Obviously, I'd like to make it all open. Um, but this does just what my users need. It has mute and unmute. It has levels. And it does also let you, if you see at the top, you're probably a bit far away uh, to see details, but where I've got input faders, which may not be a great uh, description of it, it's got main or panther, work laptop or sleepy. I mentioned that you might want different levels for different outputs. So what's in the church building versus what's going out via Zoom. Well, you can say, I want to just see faders for um, one output at a time, or you can put it onto all and it will show several faders for each input. Again, that's a bit complicated. It's not something you want to do in the middle of a service. You don't want to have to switch to the right tab and then find the right checkbox. So firstly, I don't want you to have to do that at all, if possible. Everything should be pre-programmed pre as much as possible. And secondly, we want some hardware. Having taken some hardware away, I want to reintroduce it. And this is an X-Touch Mini. I wanted to bring it in person to show the size of it. Uh, the Mackie X12 that I mentioned before is sort of about that size. Um, this is much smaller. It consists of eight knobs that also are pressable. There are little lights that go around it. You can see on there, sort of flower lights. And two rows of buttons, which light up. And for our particular purpose, I've no idea actually what these are generally used for um, because this sort of thing is called a control surface. There are various control surfaces, often annoyingly complicated or less programmable than you would like. Um, but this feels perfect for our uses. So you can mute or unmute by pressing the button and if it lights up, it's live. You can change the volume that's being output by the main. So in the church building, it's the building amplifier. Um, I've now got it so that you can have a, a secondary output that if you press and hold the knob, you can change the volume but, uh, that's going out via Zoom, but that's less often used. But this is really useful for the, it's the 20% case of, okay, well, I've switched over to the preacher and she suddenly said, OK, can we get the handheld mic out and um, pass that around the congregation for ideas? And you say, yep, that's fine. I will just press the button that's labeled handheld mic. Um, these are just dymo labels on the top 
by the way. Uh, you'll see that now I've got slightly more of them on here. Um, in the AV world, there's something called a scribble strip, which is you, you just write stuff on uh, a strip and then presumably erase it somehow, but Dymo is fine for this. Some have digital scribble sti strips. I have uh, a bit of hardware called the Icon Platform that again, I got on eBay because it sort of felt like it would be fun to try. Um, it's too big for what the church needs, but would be great in that it's got proper faders instead of these, these knobs are slightly non-ideal, but they're, they're not bad. Um, and the fun thing about the Icon Platform is they're motorized faders. So I'll show you a video later on of you control the faders. Yes, you can move them by hand, but you can also move them by software. Always fun. Okay, let's do some actual tech stuff. Looking back at this WPF app, the mixer exposes an interface uh, via OSC, this open sound control system, which is somewhat documented. And I wanted to write a WPF app that was reasonably WPF-y, you know, all view models. How do you go about doing this? If, if I move a slider here, what should it do? Obviously, it's got to send something to the mixer to say, please change the, the fader level. But when I get a signal back, do I change the same property that is also bound to the control? I've got two different sources of truth. I've got what the user has done on the GUI, and I've got what the mixer has told me. And those two sources of truth can be irritating. Excuse me while I redo my laces. Better than falling over. I found an interesting paradigm, whatever, whatever you want to call it, for doing GUIs in this sort of system, which is the user can try to move the slider as much as they want. And when they do, I'll get a signal saying the user wants to move it to whatever. If the mixer doesn't respond, um, that slider will not move at all. Because the only thing that the displayed version comes from is the mixer. So you have this weird thing of you set a property, and then if you read the same property again, very, very, very shortly afterwards, it won't show that value. It won't show it until it is actually the truth, which is a little bit confusing. Um, Initially, and you know, coming back to Dan's talk, and is that idiomatic as a way of doing GUI development? I'm not a GUI either designer or implementer normally. I have found in this situation where this is actually responds really, really quickly, it's fine. I'll come onto the mobile app a little bit later. Time is running away from me, as always. But that, that notion of what's, what's the truth, what, what should a GUI display, is something that had bugged me before when I was writing code for my drum kit. Um, and it be, it's something that I haven't seen in any GUI tutorials and things, maybe because they're not integrating with hardware, but the only source of truth until you hit save is the in-memory representation. Well, that's a lovely world to be in, but it really doesn't match to uh, what I need for this particular project. Okay. Uh, oh. Yeah, okay. One bit of interesting, interesting architecture that I was forced into and turned out to be a good thing. Um, I mentioned the Zoom SDK. Now, I have my beefs with the Zoom SDK and OAuth, but leaving those aside, for a while, the Zoom SDK would only work in 32 bits. It now does have a 64-bit version. And the protocol that I'm using to connect with cameras, cameras such as this, there are two um, protocols involved. One is Visca, which is, I think Sony came up with it a long time ago, and it used to go over RS-232 connections. These days, we use Visca over IP. And that's for controlling. So that's move the camera up a bit, down a bit, left a bit, right a bit, zoom in, zoom out. Um, change the color balance, all kinds of things that I don't actually use. And the other is NDI. Now, there are lots of ways of getting um, data from cameras. 
but NDI happens to be the one that I've picked to use um, because it provides low latency that I really do kind of need, um, and it seems to be pretty reliable. All the cameras that you can get do support um, RTMP, RTSP, all these other things. But I've integrated NDI, and that's given me a fair amount of control. Again, NDI has an SDK. Like the Zoom SDK, I've had to sort of wrap it a bit and modify it a bit. Um, I would love to be able to open source some of the modifications I've made to the C-sharp bits of the NDI SDK, but that's not open source. Um, the Zoom SDK claims to be open source, but actually isn't. They took down their GitHub repo and said, right, you can download a zip file, and it says this is community developed. Like, there's no way of providing any code back. <coughs> anyway, um, when I got a second camera for my shed, um, I found that if I had two cameras open and delivering frames, uh, so 1920 by 1080 um, in 30 frames a second, uh, then every so often I would just run out of memory. Um, I'm sure there are ways that I could tweak that, but the whole thing just crashed. I thought if this were a 64-bit process, I would be fine. And I tried doing that. So initially remove the zoom bit, try NDI with multiple sources. It's all good. So I need to use the Zoom SDK because I want to join Zoom meetings send Zoom chat messages, do Zoom spotlighting, et cetera. But I also want to have the NDI side of things. And that was the first client as a server that I ended up with. So start a new process, a 32-bit process that just does NDI, sorry, just does Zoom, and it opens a web port, port 8080, and lets you post messages from the main GUI into the Zoom server. And when I say Zoom server, I don't mean what Zoom would consider a server. It's the local bit that just does this communication. And it's a horribly ugly hack that I initially just did because it would work. I thought, it's going to be ugly, but it'll work. And then one day, when I wasn't actually in the church building, I was preaching somewhere else, at your service crashed. And the Zoom meeting kept going because the Zoom server was still running. My friend Lola reopened at your service, and it all just continued. So I'd introduced this sort of reliability separation entirely because of an artificial limit, but it turned out to be really handy. So the Zoom SDK now supports 64 bits. I might use the 64, uh, might use the 64 bit SDK in the future, but I'm going to keep that separation. So the idea of an application being in two parts one being the GUI that does, still does most of the operations and something else that it talks to, which can be annoying sometimes because you're wanting to find out how many participants have I got on Zoom every, um, at the moment? What are the latest chat messages, etc. I'm using polling. I'm polling, I think, the Zoom bit twice a second or something to say, well, what participants are there now? What participants are there now? It's kind of annoying. But it works, and it does provide this extra reliability. That whole idea became really, really useful later on. Let me just go over some of the bits where I've been doing integrating. And I really want to get over how much fun it has been doing this integration where there's been appropriate documentation. The most amazing bit was the Visca part. So the first camera I got, um, was PTZ Optics, and there, there are a bunch of cameras like this, Minaray, Zowie Tech, um, PTZ Optics, and a few others, and they're largely the same with different levels of support and support from different countries. Um, but the PTZ Optics user manual, and I think the others as well, show all the Visca, uh, Visca commands, say, right, these are the bytes that you should send, and these are the bytes you'll get back. And this isn't particularly aimed at developers as a product, I don't think. So I was surprised and really pleasantly surprised by this, but I had no idea how to send them. It's like, it's on port 1054, uh, 10,054. Um, or, sorry, 6789 is the PTC Optics one by default. Um, send Visca packets. I was like, but what's in a Visca packet? You've told me this bit of 
the data bit, but what does the, what does the rest of this packet look like? Oh, there isn't any. The, those are the bytes you send and it will move. It's like, okay, well, I can try that. Try that. The camera moved. And the, the exhilaration and delight of um, sending, a, sending literally about four bytes and the camera goes, it's like, wow, that's amazing. So the, these are the integration points. Um, MIDI I use for the XSuch Mini, um, and also entirely separately, our church organ supports MIDI, and as it happens, our organist has been recording himself playing hymns over the last few years before the pandemic struck. So now, because he's getting older, as we all are, um, but he's rather older than the average in, in this room and is worried that if he has a fall or something, there are relatively few organists in the church. What do we do? Well, now you can have a MIDI file, play it back through the church organ, but from at your service, and it's as if David is there. It's wonderful. Um, and that, that's literally a case of just send the MIDI data down. I don't need to care what the MIDI data is other than controlling the volume of it. Uh, whereas for this, I had to find out what MIDI commands, because MIDI is mostly for someone's turned this note on, you know, played this note at this volume with this attack or whatever, which isn't quite the same as um, pressing buttons and turning knobs. So when you encapsulate that a bit and, and try to make that usable, you get one library that you can then integrate into at your service. Open sound control is for the XR18 that I mentioned before, NDI for the actual data from the cameras, Visca I've mentioned for pan tilt zoom. Joe, I'm not actually going to go through all this. You can read it for yourself, but it's there's a lot of stuff. I will mention the foot pedal. <laughs> this is the easiest semi integration. I've actually abandoned this because it turns out I can't multitask. Um, I used to play in the junior church band. Um, the the junior church bit of it is a misnomer, but the the idea was I would be able to play the recorder and change the words that were being shown on, on screen. But if I've got to reach for a hardware button or, or even a key, well, all my fingers are kind of busy, but you can get USB foot pedals that you can then program. So all I had to do was program it to be right arrow, plug it in, and then I'm playing along, press your foot down, words change, keep playing. Yeah, it turns out I then forgot to change the words because I'm too busy playing or I'll get the wrong notes. So that sort of integration that, does, that did work but um, didn't work in my brain. And finally, Google Cloud Storage um, for installers, useful, and more importantly, service resources. Okay, I've sort of talked about it quite a lot. Let me show you what I mean. And we can actually use this demo bit to evaluate not the code, but the result against Dan's Cupid properties. So this is at your service, the main UI. Now, one of the weird things about this was designing it so that you could use it at home and you could use it in the church building because you want to be able to prepare stuff at home and test it. Well, I've got two monitors at home, but actually I don't have two monitors when I'm doing stuff on the sofa. Um, so I'm going to move the window a bit because if you don't have a second monitor connected, it sort of thinks, well, I'll use the top right hand side of the, uh, the screen to be your fake um, projector. <clears throat> so if I show a video, I can just double click and let me pause this briefly. Um, the idea of a scene within a service is that has everything you need for one chunk of the service. So that could be some prayers or a hymn or whatever it is. And that needs to turn the mics on and off, start a video, start showing words, etc. And this was where I was absolutely keen to have, yes, we've got a hardware mixer, sorry, a, a bit of hardware control, but you shouldn't have to use it very often because most of the time, all you need to do is move to the right scene and everything will be ready for you. Just make it all integrated. 
Um, I will now show the video just because it's quite fun of, this is the icon platform that I mentioned before. And it's, it's just a bit weird to see these um, motorized faders doing their own thing. That's about that wide and about that deep and only has eight, so we, we could have 16, but it does have a digital scribble strip. At the very top, you might see it saying MCP mode selected. I've now got it so that it would display the, um, the titles of each of the channels automatically, but I've never used this in the church building. <coughs> so let's first look at composability for this application. You, you've seen most of, you've seen 90% of what, what you should do with uh, at your service now is once you've got a service ready you go from scene to scene and then if you've got ones with some words you go from one page of words to another and then you might need to move cameras around this is a fake camera so the green bit is where it's sort of zoomed into so if we if we decide to zoom in the rectangle gets smaller or bigger. In fact, let's do that, do that with a more interesting um, camera. So let's, oh, let's zoom in on Dan, as I know he won't mind. Um, so this is, this is a sort of fake pan tilt zoom camera. Obviously, it's not got any moving heads. Everything is more fun when it actually physically moves around. I would say, or where there are lights that come on. Um, so far I have resisted, I, I've got myself uh, a little set of LEDs, a bit like these, these lights, and a, a laser and some things that I control with DMX. I have so far resisted getting a DMX Spox machine. So, you know, when, when on Strictly or whatever, as they come out, a load of sparks come up, you can control those from your computer. Ah, oh, doesn't that sound fun? I haven't got one. I have absolutely no excuse for getting one, so I'm not doing so. However, um, you can see that we've got multiple pages of text and we can do a few text effects. Let me stop the scene and let's go in and look at the composition of that because it is all completely composed. Each scene consists of a bunch of different things and no one aspect of it, other than text I'll mention, um, knows about what else is going on. So you can have PowerPoint and a camera in the same scene and even media and start showing a video and then bring PowerPoint to the front and then do other things. And some of these would not make sense together because they're not really orthogonal. Showing a video and showing a PowerPoint, you would normally just put the video into PowerPoint. But there's no point in prohibiting it, so let's just keep it there. Um, text is slightly interesting in that I've got two modes for text, which depends on whether anything else is coming up on the screen. Um, obviously sound is orthogonal to whatever's being displayed, but this is another example of this does exactly what I need it to for my particular use case. And this is the joy of doing a, a project for a small user base where you know the requirements absolutely. So if I show text with camera, that will show the words in the bottom. And that's how we display hymn words on a Sunday morning with a, con uh, a camera pointing at the congregation and we can then, uh, people at home can see other people singing along, they're, they're happy, they see their friends, it's all good, and we bring the words up at the bottom. At other times, it may be that you don't actually want any cameras, in which case, you don't want all that wasted space so you can have text on its own. But at that point, you can get more onto the screen. So this is the same text file, song, whatever you want to call it. <coughs> and if you're not displaying anything else, we've got the idea of half pages and if you've got camera or anything else showing, we display half a page at a time. If you haven't, we display a full page at a time. It's very, very, very specific. I wouldn't expect 
any other software package to have this functionality. And the idea is you really can um, show the same source. So this is all, um, if I go and edit again, it's in a file and I can't zoom in easily, but it's, it's a sort of markdown like thing where I've got triple equals is a full page break and triple hyphens is a half page break. And if you put the hyphens in brackets, then it, um, then it makes the half page break not have a line break. If I, I've got live preview. So this is with a half page break that would normally be between two short verses of a hymn. Again, it's really specific to our use case. But if you've got long verses, you don't want that extra blank line. So you can display the same, uh, the same text in two different ways. So coming back to Dan's Cupid, uh, the application is composable in terms of each scene is very much composed from individual bits. Um, it's also composable in terms of once a scene is going, you can still change with either the hardware um, or well, the mixer tab. So I'm not connected to a real mixer at the moment. Um, but if I move the, coming back to what I was saying earlier on, if I move the slider, that has to talk to a fake mixer to know that it can actually move. Um, so I've got a mixer that, that responds to the same kind of open source con uh, control protocol, but just doesn't connect to anything physical. Otherwise, that button wouldn't move at all. The, the slider wouldn't move. Um, so people can do that at the time. Likewise, you can move the cameras around whether you've put a camera into the scene or not. You can always override it in the, um, at the time. It's definitely not Unix philosophy in that it is meant to be one tool that does everything. But within that tool, they're sort of compartmentalized bits of functionality. <clears throat> What's P, Dan? I've forgotten. Predictable. Predictable. Mostly. Oh, this one bug. So for the most part, everything works fine. Um, yes, but only once I worked out what it was. Dan asked whether the bug was consistent. I had a bug um, around sound. So. If I, if I start a new service and it does nice things like uh, this has suggested that if I use the test service template, it's going to come up with a title of 2022 05 15 test 15 May. Uh, that's because the 15th of May is the next Sunday. You can say in your templates file, which has no GUI to edit it whatsoever, because I'm going to be the only person ever doing this. It's just a JSON file. You can say, this kind of service always happens on a Sunday um, and at, at a particular time of day. And it will say, well, when's the next one of those going to be? That's probably what you mean. So most of the time, you can say new service and just OK. And then we've got templates within that. And OK, so when I clicked on song, sorry, the text is really small because it doesn't have a presentation mode, as it were. Um, it's put the Shure SM58 microphone as on by default. It turned out, and if I, yeah, let me demonstrate the next bit, which is some funky song. So we've got three bits in this service, and then I'm preparing this at home. I can then synchronize with the cloud. Um, it's gonna fail because it's on my custom network here rather than being able to get to Google Cloud Storage where everything is actually stored. But it would say, oh, I will synchronize up um, any changes to songs you've made and any, um, any new services, et cetera. I had a weird bug where if you had synchronized and then you did a new service, then a load of the templates lost what their mixer controls were for weird reasons that unfortunately it was hard to make the, the code as idiomatic as I would have liked to, because basically some of these are effectively singletons. They're not singletons within the code, but you know, everything, um, 
the window has a reference to, this is what I think the world is, this is what I think the templates are, etc. Well, if you synchronize down some new templates, you need to remember to reload your in-memory representation that the window has of those templates, otherwise things get out of sync. So it was really easy to fix once I found it, but I, I only saw it because I noticed various services that didn't have all the sound attached to them that they should. So you, know, you would bring up a hymn and there would be, you know, all the mics would be muted. Right? This is bad. I will try to reproduce this. New song. No, it's fine. It's only, <laughs> only if you do synchronization and it changes a configuration so it needs to reload stuff and then you do new, new service. Like, that was not fun to, to work out. Uh, idiomatic. It tries to be as idiomatic as I can make it um, from the perspective of people who are going to use this. So I would love a better name than cloud. So cloud and synchronize, and this comes a little bit into the D bit uh, of domain driven. Um, cloud and synchronize probably aren't terms that half of my users will really want. It's easy enough for them to learn. That's one thing to do. <coughs> but most stuff is in terms of songs, for example. You browse the song database. There's nothing inherently songy about most of this. They're just effectively text files all smooshed into one big file. Um, but oh, they do have copyright and CCLI and you know, a few other bits of metadata that are song-like. It's much easier for people to understand that than um, if I just said, you know, text aspects or whatever. And I have a fairly friendly about bit with, you can show the log, check for updates. In fact, I think show the log is only, only displayed if you're in an advanced mode. So I have an advanced menu item here with encrypt some text. Um, that's used for various reasons, and switching configurations, because I want to be able to do my demo configuration, and my church configuration, and my development configuration. Um, no one else wants to see that menu, so they don't end up seeing it. So I would say it's idiomatic to a, to a degree on that front, and the domain-driven, um, I will demonstrate in terms of code rather than application, so Dan, you will be hopefully happy with this. I have folders here called camera and cloud storage and initialization is a bit vague, but media, MIDI playback, mixer, monitors, OBS, PowerPoint, etc. And the same is replicated in the mobile app. Despite initially, you start new mobile app and it says, here are your views, here are your view models. And I said, I don't want to do that. Uh, Unloaded it. And it's it's a bit weird because in my mobile app, so in, in the main application, each of those folders has quite a few bits of code because it does quite a lot. The mobile app um, does almost nothing, which means each of these folders has two or three files. Now, I've done two different versions of the mobile app, which is really overkill for a mobile app that only one person has ever used. Um, the second one I tried was Avalonia UI, and I thought, okay, I'll stick with views and view models. And to some extent, it did feel better because I just got two folders. One had just views in, one had just view models in. <clears throat> but I've ended up keeping this as the Maui app. I kept it this way, and I think I will keep it this way because I can name everything the same way in the mobile app that it's named in the main application, and it's all consistent. OK, let's nip back. I've got six minutes. That's not nearly time enough. Never mind. <clears throat> I've shown you the um, X-Touch Mini, but that's only one of the extra bits of hardware. The other is a Stream Deck. As of interest, how many folks have seen Stream Decks before? Oh, not many. These are lovely bits of kit. Um, like everything AV-wise, they're not terribly cheap. I think one of this will be about 130 pounds, and the bigger one, um, it's not that size, but it's about that size, um, is about 200 pounds. And it's just a load of buttons, but it so happens that each button is also a screen. 
And this is lovely because I have users who don't really like using keyboard and mouse and don't really want to be using a computer at all. But if they've got a button that says Helen and a button that says him one or, or you know, um, lo he comes with clouds descending written in fairly small text, it would probably only show lo he comes, but that's fine. They can press that button and they'll know what it will do and it gets on with stuff. And if they're trying to go to the right page in a hymn, they can either see all the hymn words down here or realistically, you don't need to go hopping from page to page in a hymn, you just want to go through the whole thing linearly. So I have this lovely next button that is green until it goes red when you've reached the end. And literally you just need to keep, oh, end of the verse, I'll press next. End of the verse, I'll press next. End of the verse, I'll pr press next. I've got some users, bear in mind that my total user base is six or seven. Some people ignore this completely and just use keyboard, mouse, and the, the PC user interface. Some people use this almost exclusively and don't touch anything else. So it's been really useful to find out what different people like and adjust things to them. It's sort of a, a tiny, the, the requirements um, loop, feedback loop is really, really short, which is great. Um, so the way that I've typically worked with all of this is I've had an idea for something. I will then generally make it work and usually, and I've got better at this over time, but usually the first iteration of it is a bit clunky in one way or another. But I've gone ahead, right, let's make sure it's ready to use in production. So this is in production every Sunday and usually that means updating it from the version that was previously installed the previous Sunday because there are changes every week. Make it work, use it, and I take a notebook. I've got a small notebook that I take to the church building every time I'm on duty and I literally write little bullet points. Um, so yesterday I wrote uh, you know, socket closed for zoom spotlight, set selection mode to none for mixers, set the tab to the first camera. I haven't implemented that you know, yet. You know, if, if a scene has one camera on, should I change the tab in the advanced area to highlight that one? I don't know, I'll, I'll think about doing that. I get it to work, teach other people to use it, and then find out what the real pain points are, because the ones that you write aren't gonna be the ones that other people find. You know, I can make it, I can go from hard to use to easy for me to use, but that's not the same as easy for other people to use. You need to find out their, their mental models. One of the striking things has been uh, one of my users who I happen to know best is younger than me, very IT literate. He, in the first time that he was using the app in production, having barely practiced with it before, he was thinking, oh, in that third hymn, I wonder whether I could show the band at the top half of the screen and the congregation at the second, in the bottom half of the screen. And he was about to do exactly the right thing to do that. I was saying, it would work, but let's just take things a bit easier. But he got the right, or rather he got the same mental model as me very, very quickly. So what else have we been doing since, since this started? I started writing this on February the 6th, 2021. So it's been 15 months and we started with one camera at the back of the church and I thought that's going to be fine. Cameras are expensive. They're about, the, the ones we use are about 1700 pounds each new. And I thought, so one is going to be plenty for everyone. 640K will be enough for everyone. And then we found reasons to have two more cameras. And one, both of those reasons actually sound quite trivial, but have made an enormous difference. We've now got two cameras one in the center and one a bit off to the side. And the problem is people were feeling a bit seasick because our lectern, you would see over here, and then we've got a pulpit, which is only used for doing readings these days, um, over here. If you swing a camera over in terms of panning, you get this feeling um, and it makes you feel seasick, at least made me feel seasick. I ended up saying, okay, well, 
If I know that it's panning over from one to another, I can fade it down, move it over, fade it back up. That's great, but then you've got a bit of black for a while, and it's, it interrupts the worship. It's really, really important to me that all of this is just enabling something else. It's great and fantastic for a tech perspective, and that's great for me, but 99% of my church is not me. They don't want tech, they want to worship smoothly. And it fading to black and then saying, oh, is something wrong with Zoom, is not a good experience. If we've got two cameras, one can be pointed at the pulpit, one at the lectern, or lectern pulpit, um, and switch from one to the other, and it just is seamless. We've got another camera that's at the front pointing at the congregation for three reasons. Um, the one that I immediately, as soon as we started using this for weddings, thought, I really want a camera at the front, is the entrance of the bride. If you're going to give people a video of their wedding, you really want to see the bride being able to come in. And you know, it's, a, it's a big moment for everyone. We could only do it from when she was about halfway up, and we then get the back of her head. And we can sort of follow her up and tilt, but it's not the same as being able to see, it, see her face on. The second was dear to my heart because my wife Holly runs the guides and brownies units um, in, in our church and when they're doing a parade you want to be able to see the guides and brownies parading in. And the third, which I hadn't really anticipated, was um, when people at home are watching and singing along with a hymn, they like to be able to see the faces of the congregation who are also singing them rather than the backs of their heads. So we now have three cameras. Um, which is wonderful. Unfortunately, sort of unfortunately, that means I've got to have three pan tilt zoom cameras at home as well. Mine are cheaper, you know, not knockoff ones, but they're bought from eBay rather than new, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but my shed is massively over-provisioned for a shed. Um, things like an improvement over our previous system, where the only place that we had Zion Works installed was on the church computer in the church building. So you had to either go up the day before or be brazen enough to say, I will rock up at quarter past 10 and hope that I can put the service together in quarter of an hour before starting. Well, no, it's really useful to be able to uh, prepare it at home, synchronize it up to the cloud, then in the church building, synchronize it down and you're away. The mobile app, I'm, yeah, I'm out of time, so I will finish with the mobile app. This was actually almost a dare from a friend of mine. It's like, well, you've finished now, right? You, you've got nothing else to do. Um, next, you'll do a mobile app. I was like, no, that would be very, very silly. Oh, but mm, would it at least be feasible? This is the nice thing about a hobby app. If someone said that at, at work, saying, oh, right, now you've done this, you can do this silly thing, you'd just say, no, I've got more important things to do. Like, but it sounds fun. And Maui's coming out. I've been keeping an eye on Maui. This would be a great opportunity to try it. I started the mobile app on Tuesday, um, and on Sunday I was using it in production. Just being able to say that, and I'm not a mobile developer, just want to really emphasize that. I used the same idea that I'd had before um, of having a desktop app that was also a server. So this time the main um, the main UI, which I've now stopped, um, it starts, in fact, now two ports. One, a UDP port, so the mobile app can just discover the system automatically if it's on the same subnet, yay. Um, so you start the app and it says, I've connected to, at your service, um, the appropriate configuration, etc." But it also starts an HTTP port that the mobile app just polls saying, what scenes have you got? What, what are the text of the currently selected scene? Um, what PowerPoint, I didn't show, the PowerPoint presentation is very cool because you can ask the PowerPoint SDK or you know, interop level to render the PowerPoint slides to images. So I can then send those images to both the stream deck, so as well as text saying what the hymns are, it can show you little, little thumbnails of PowerPoint slides and you can also get them on the mobile app, say, oh yes, that's the slide I want now, instead of just slide one, slide two, et cetera. It's these little things that make my day. Um, and it's all just JSON over just HTTP. It's not even HTTPS because you know, what shared certificate am I gonna have, et cetera. Might do something about that. 
but actually the security, no one else is on that network in the church building because we've got a you know, separately provisioned ones for guest access, etc. And it's been genuinely useful. I am now out of, very much out of time. Anyway, the main thing I want to get across is this bottom thing. Writing software that you see being used is rewarding. It's rewarding for you, for tech things. You know, I could go on, I've said about half of what I've learned doing all of this. It's immensely fun. Interoperating with hardware is immensely fun as well because you get to integrate with all the great things that other people have done. Um, but just you can use it for learning, trying things out and deliver value to other people and people that you know. And they can come up to you afterwards and say, that was really useful. How about if we could do something slightly different? Um, so I hope you will go away and do something amazing that's got nothing to do with AV, but maybe has integration with other hardware because it's fun, but does something useful and you can learn at the same time. I'm massively over time, but thank you very much. <laughs>